Well, greetings, greetings, everyone. I hope that you all can hear me and hear me loud and clear. Yes, you see the systems behind me. Literally, my internet went out on my computer right before the broadcast. So uh, luckily, I have my wife's computer here and it's all set up and ready to go when I could keep things moving. And thankfully, she does not have to use it right now at this moment, or I probably have to figure something else out. So it is great to be amongst you all on another Friday. Thank you for tuning in to Tony Briscoe Live. I know my hair is growing. It's everywhere. It keeps getting in my face and all of those great things. Hey, it is great to be here. I want to start off thinking about something. After 9-11, there was a commission that was formed. Believe it or not, there was a smaller commission formed after the incident when Mr. Eric Snowden, who was known as a whistleblower, exposed the government's espionage on its own people. So we've had commissions that have been formed all across the country for different things. All right. Yes, there was even a commission on Dr. King spying on him as well. There is a commission in New York that spied on hip hop artists where police officers would follow them around and all sorts of things. But isn't it interesting when it comes to January 6, 2001, nobody wants to have a commission. And I really can't think about why, but I just wanted to wet your whistle for a minute. I'll close out at the end of this with my personal thoughts. But now I want to introduce to my Be In The Mix family, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful lady. I have been under her tutelage, my goodness. I don't even know how many years. Uh, if you talk about a teacher who has pushed you in the right direction, who has forced you to challenge everything you think you know about the sacred text in the Holy Bible, um, man, it is, it, is, it is definitely the guest that I'm bringing on. But with that, she has been a supporter of Tony Briscoe for years. She believes in me. She believed in me when I didn't see things possible and when I didn't even believe and myself. And so I just want to bring in the wonderful Dr. Rosa Sales. Dr. Sales, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, to look around and go, who? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I thank you. I thank you. You've been yes. a joy. And I, I marvel at the things that you've done um, of, of the way you've grown and the way you've brought others in my generation as well as your own generation and younger people into a knowledge of what's going on in our community in our world in our faith so thank you Tony absolutely Bristol. absolutely <laughs> so no you're, you're very welcome so i wanted to bring you in to talk about the ezra project which you are mm -hmm. the founder of but first yeah. i wanted to share a story <laughs> so we are doing training and dr sales is our <laughs> trainer all right this this may be like I don't know. I don't know how long ago it was, maybe 20 years ago. Regardless of that, Dr. Sales, like she likes to use objects when she's teaching. Only she gives you an object only for instruction, instructional purposes. So she throws Tony Briscoe a ball. Literally the entire time she's teaching, because I am Tony Briscoe, I play with this ball almost the entire time she's teaching. And she's just like, boy, would you stop? <laughs> But it, it was just hilarious. Like it was hilarious to me because you put zero pressure on me. You were just like, "This dude is a big kid." I, I, and you, I remember you saying something along the lines of, "Remind me never again to give Tony Briscoe an object to play with while I'm teaching." And so, Doctor Sales, how long? Just give people your history of how long you've been one an educator. Um, how long were you teaching? How long were you administ being an administrator in Chicago? Okay, let's go with the public education persona first. Um, I started teaching uh, at Wadsworth Elementary School, actually. Uh, I taught there four years before I went to Carver High School. And I was at Carver High School for 27 years. Wow. I left there, uh, met my husband there, taught bunches of relatives, including my sister, cousins, all kinds of people. Um, but it was a tight knit community in Gill, different from anything anybody else would even have imagined. Um, I left there, uh, went to central office and I was in administration for about seven years um, in both the, um, in the reading and, and writing uh, areas as well as um, 
professional development. So 34 years all together with Chicago Public Schools. And when I left Chicago Public Schools, um, God turned my mind around. It was funny. I'd, I'd been Sunday school superintendent for some years and working in Christian education for years on a national platform. But when I left, when I retired, uh, God turned me completely to um, faith and and use gifts that I knew I had, but hadn't used them. So I became, I began to write. I began to teach even more in churches and across platforms. Uh, uh, in states and so forth like that. So I've been teaching for nigh on, as they say, uh, <laughs> not on more than 40 years. I just stopped right there. Yes, ma'am. Understood. I won't Understood. get too close to any real numbers. But yes, I, I will not ask any questions about real numbers. Thank you so much. I, I know Thank better. You. I know better. So before we dive into the Ezra Project, I do want to talk to you about the education system today mm. in America. Specifically mm -hmm. because COVID, 18 months of remote learning, yeah, it's almost as if the world didn't see it coming. Specifically, America didn't see it coming. Um, I know I was trying to do some implementations at a certain organization that we should move to this hybrid model early. We should move to a one-to-one -one model early. Not knowing this was coming, but I had mm -hmm. these thoughts seven, six years ago of things that we should be working on uh, in, in the educational sphere, just mm -hmm. in case. My entire mm -hmm. my entire undergrad was all remote. And okay. so when I graduated in 2018, it was all remote. And that was from NIU, go Huskies. But I just yeah. thought like, wow, if colleges yeah. are already preparing this hybrid model for education, why is there a reason that high schools, not in grand form at least, are not going with the same approach to education. So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? And what are your thoughts on, I know you I know you still have contacts. I know you've heard about the failure rate with remote learning. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that before we move on. Uh, that's, a, that's a big one. Um, first, let me say that when COVID hit, like I told you, my mind, I went from public education to faith-based education. And when COVID hit, I tell people I was like that years ago, before I even knew about it, um, horses pulled milk carts. And when they went to trucks, when they were automated, the horses still wanted to walk the route. Wow. And so the minute I heard about uh, COVID and I knew what was going on in school, my mind flipped completely. And I was like, I got to help. I've got to find a way. I've got to, but I've been out of the system. There wasn't, you know, my contacts aren't uh, uh, current now. Right. So there was no way for me to say, can I help somebody? Because you're about to be in trouble. But I saw it coming. Mm -hmm. What we see now is what has been all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, people think that, you know, schools are just catching on. Those are schools of poverty that we're seeing. The schools of affluence have been online all the time. They've been using resources differently all the time. The system is made so that uh, in schools of poverty, um, you're not going to have the progress, um, the whole notion about testing um, and teaching to the test. When I taught, uh, and I'm a golden apple teacher, my husband and I both were, wow. and the joy of teaching and watching young people grow, okay? But you can't do that if you can only go this far. If you can't uh, tie things to to their lives, if you can't open up things in a different way. So what we're seeing now, I'll, I'll try to rein this in, what we're seeing now is the inherent racism in the system. Mm. Uh, my doctorate was about that racism. It was about my dissertation. It was about the fact that um, education for black people in this country, in this city has always been second class. And so what we're seeing now is that there was no reason that the, that the schools could not have done more with computers, but it was misappropriated in schools of poverty and not, um, not made a priority in terms of what people should be doing, what, what kids should be learning, uh, not, not even trying to connect what young people did in their lives with what happens in schools. And so we still have that model where in third grade, you, you kind of see what's the failure rate in third grade. OK, that's how many people we're going to send to the penal system. You still have that model where um, 
you make some assumptions about families and you don't try to bring people together and you don't try to, to deal with what's in the street. You can't just deal with what's happening in the school and blame the school or deal with the school. You've got to deal with it system, systematically. Yes. And so because it's a systemic problem. And so I'm very concerned about what's going on now. Our kids were behind before, but those who had good teachers could kind of struggle and push and, and you know, do, do better. Um, but now the system is such that kids aren't in school. They're, they don't know what to do. And, and my, one of my fears is that instead of teaching young people in ways that help them to learn and grow and keep their dignity and out of that dignity, then began to want to do things in this world that what's going to happen now is our kids are about to be browbeaten. They're about to be hit over the head with, okay, all right, you got to, you know, I was, I was shocked when I heard somebody say they were testing this year. Are you serious? Are you serious? Yes. I have a girlfriend who um, was subbing and uh, she, she had to teach an art class. The kids couldn't turn the cameras on because the situations at home were, you know, precarious. And so, and she said, so how do I know that you did what I told you in the art class if I can't see what you're doing? You know, this it was not thought through um, and not just in Chicago, but everywhere. Yeah. And I'm afraid now that what's going to happen is that we've lost time. And instead of actually giving thought to how we can help our young people grow as people, OK, because you can't go back and capture a year. You can't treat everybody like they're in second grade. Right. You know? So. I'm concerned that our kids are going to be browbeaten, that the system is going to, again, uh, find ways to to try to make it the fault of teachers or the fault of the school or the fault of the child without looking systemically at what's going on in that child's world and in, in our world in general. Wow. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for sharing that. I, I definitely appreciate that insight uh, and everything. I think with, you know, ISBE pretty much mandating that all schools open in the fall, mm -hmm. I'm just like, wow. So we're just going to go back to what we were doing, which exactly. wasn't necessarily bad, but wasn't necessarily great. But now we're right. going back to right. rush back into school. Let's just get them back in the building. And there are still many factors to consider. Like I understand yeah. somewhat of the pandemic. I get COVID and all of that. But we're just it's like we're just going to, hey, let's just go back to life as normal. And I'm like, no, we'll never no. be back to life at normal. That no. means we should never be teaching back to normal and our right. system and our structure of teaching has just been problematic mm -hmm. from day one. Um, it's interesting you bring up the third grade piece and how they mm -hmm. use that data to say, okay, great, we can build this many prisons based off of all of these exactly. failures, as opposed to saying in the black community, hey, if this is the failure rate for third graders, what can we actually do to change that? Because right. somehow human life has to be more valuable for the benefit of the country than it is for the penal system. Right. Unless we're going back to the penal system as being the bread and butter of the country. I still think the United yeah. States has the most incarcerated individuals um, we than the world does. And so we do. saying we're leaders, yeah, that may be true, but what are we leading in at the end of the day? Right. I, I want to point out a couple of other things too. I, um, I have a number of degrees and yet in the midst of the pandemic, I decided I wanted to go to school. And so this was the first time I went to school online, trust me. It's a shift, wow. uh, but um, it was interesting to see where educational theory was, where um, educational resources were going across the world, and particularly across the United States, and how those things were light years ahead of what our kids are getting. You know, the, um, there are certain educational theories like flipped classroom that say, you know, you do the homework in the classroom. And you know, and you read you read the stuff at home, or you get videos and whatever that help you get up to speed. And then the teacher is there to help you go through the practical parts of what you do. Common sense used everywhere, not in the black community. We don't even meet around those things. We don't even look at um, what resources are being given to our young people. And so we were behind. We're staying behind. And as you said, everybody just wants to get back to normal. Let's just get back to normal. Turn on a barbecue pit. Everybody right. go out in the street. We're going to have fun. But, it, but the world is not that. Yeah. Take, take your mask off. Just everybody right. just have Thank one you. big party. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. The Ezra Project. 
Yes. Talk to us about why it was formed, what it's formed for, and the work that it's doing from awards to scholarships and specifically the faith-based community in which it addresses. Okay. Um, I, I tell people this uh, uh, story of how it was birthed. My husband and I were on a cruise in the middle of the night, in the middle of the ocean, God wakes me up and says, honor these people. Mm. Get up and make a list. Okay, what you want me to do? I come home and I tell my girlfriend, I said, God said, I have to honor these people. I don't even know where to go. How do I start? What do I do? And so she gave me a suggestion about a place. And so we did it. You know, I was just doing what God said. It was just a one-time thing. And the, the response was overwhelming. So it was obvious we had to do another year. We started out honoring um, the kind of unsung heroes in Christian education, because that was my thing. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. They came from different churches, different faith traditions. And uh, so for about four years, we were just doing Christian education. And then we thought there were some people who had been influential in, in my life and in the lives of some of our board members that we wanted to honor. So we named awards for them, which allowed us to expand. So now unsung heroes might be in Christian education, in church leadership, in pastoral care. Um, and there are even awards for people who are involved uh, nationally in their denominations. And this year for the first time, we have a humanitarian award. Wow. Um, so we're looking at the people who make a difference in lives, but they're not the people that you see standing up and they're not the people that you see um, on the news, but they're there, they're steady, they're, they're working with people. Um, and so this year, the Humanitarian Award will go to Andrew Holmes, uh, who will be our uh, first Humanitarian Award person. And we also, they range in age. We started out saying they had to do 50 years worth of work. And now we say 35, <laughs> but the 35 can be, most of them still end up with 50 because it's not just the work in the church, although that's the, the key piece, but also sometimes, especially with teachers, you have people who were uh, in leadership roles in public education and in Christian education. So that you get this span. Yes. So the idea at first was to, to recognize these people. Um, when my husband passed, he and I were both educators. As I said, we're both Golden Apples teachers. And so we wanted to do something to honor that legacy. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to do something for young people. So we started something called the sales legacy. And the sales legacy um, identifies young people who are giving back to the community, the black community and wow. to the churches. Young uh, people. Yes. The young folk who are coming out of high school, going into college or into some vocational school, because that's what my husband did. He was an accountant and that's what he did. He helped uh, develop vocational programs about the city of Chicago. So nice. that's, that's that was expanded then to that. Um, and uh, then we started getting into other issues and, and I'll get to that, like human trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, but the work that we do is basically, it, like I said, it started out just honoring these people, letting them know that we appreciate them, letting their families in a lot of cases realize who they were, you yeah. know, because grandma's just grandma till you find out, you know, <laughs> what grandma's influence was right. and, and what she's still doing. So that's kind of where we were. But um, there are several things that I wanted Ezra to do and not just give awards, but also to increase the dialogue about theology and about life um, to help uh those going into ministry to be educated for it in the black community, in black and brown communities, actually, and in Pentecostal churches, the um, rate at which uh, clergy are trained is very low. Very often clergy members are not educated for that position at all. There's not another job in the world that you would walk in and nobody says, did you go to school? Wow. Do you know how to do this? Do you, know, <laughs> you know, what do you know? And yes. so what we end up doing is talking to ourselves, remembering what things were and kind of making up as we go along. Mm -hmm. and what you'll find is that that makes for bad theology, makes for bad understanding of the Bible, makes for bad understanding in the community. Um, one of the good things that's come out of out of COVID is that churches had to step outside of themselves and say, what am I doing here? 
you know, I thought I was here so I, people had a place to come. Now right. that the people can't come, how do I go out and help them? Right. And so that kind of training we want to do. So the Rosa Sales Legacy Award is for um, adults who are in seminary or Bible college, an accredited seminary or Bible college. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're trying to educate on all levels. We're trying to elevate the conversation about what churches do, what churches should be doing, um, and kind of make a um, just a connection between the church and the world and uh, our young people and our seniors. So that's what we do. I probably answered 95 questions. And you probably did, but it's all good. I love it. I love it. Like they see me all the time. They're here to hear you. But it, it sounds like the legacy of impact is what Ezra is, the Ezra Project is acknowledging. Why is mm -hmm. it important? Why is it important? So, so we always say sometimes like, oh, you know, just do what you do and just do it unto the glory of the Lord. Don't worry about the appreciation. But we all, Thank like you. to be appreciated like let's yeah. we can just be real about that you know right. um right. why is it important to let people know while they are here their story their contributions to the church their contributions to the community why is it important to share that information well i think it's important on several levels with them as you said personally you know, everybody likes a pat on the back. You can act like you don't. You can act like, you know, well, it's okay. That's not true. Everybody likes a smile and a pat on the back. And so, but the influence you have on someone, you don't know until I'm running into a problem. I need to get a plug. Um, we don't, you don't know until someone tells you and gives you some feedback. The other thing is to let their families know and to let their churches know how these people are seen. When, as people age in particular, younger people think, oh, that's old. I, I laughed when I realized that for my students, everything was back in the day. It didn't matter if it was George Washington or, or uh, Martin Luther King, it was all back in the day. And so was yesterday, you know, so, to let young people know what these people are doing and the influence that they've had. Often we think what we're doing right now is everything, but it's not everything. There's an influence that we have that goes beyond um, the moment. And so you need to know who came before you. If we don't know, I think Carter G. Woodson said, if you don't know your history, uh, then you're bound to repeat some of those things that, that were not good. And so we need to let people know legacy is important. We must build on it. We don't, in the black community, we don't do that enough. It bothers me, for example, and this, I digress from Ezra, but it bothers me when um, someone says, well, why are we celebrating Black History Month in February? Why did they give us the smallest month in the year? And I go, you don't know your history. Carter G. Woodson picked it because of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln and the freeing of the slaves. Nobody gave you anything. Right. What you need to be doing is celebrating your history all year. But if you don't know it, one of the problems we have with COVID now is, you know, as I see Black Lives Matter, when COVID hit, I told people my mind started flipping backwards. I was immediately into 1968. And now I'm in before I was born, you know, the, the way things go. So we have to know legacy. We have to know who went before, we have to know what's going on and we have to kind of just make, keep it real. So that's what, that's what we do. And that's why it's so important. That's great. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. I mean, you know, be, being an artist, like the last thing I want to say is, Oh yeah, I take the stage, but I don't want anybody to applaud me afterwards. And right. I don't want, yeah, it's like, no, like I, I right. appreciate some accolades. I like, I like the slow clap standing ovation. <laughs> I love that too. It's, right. it's interesting when you think of legacy and what the project is doing, in my book, there's a poem called Legacy. Mm -hmm. And I literally just talk about, I just go through this story of me chasing corporate dollars mm -hmm. versus really, really just making that leap of faith and stepping into the community. And I end the poem saying, there hails Tony Briscoe uh, on the cover of Time Magazine, you know, getting, yeah. you know, technologist of the year right. while a young man that he failed to mentor just got arrested, triple homicide, exactly. legacy. And that's kind of where I am literally right now. Like mm -hmm. I, I've got a great friend who just decided I'm going to put all 100% of me into my not-for-profit to keep and save these black and brown boys. And I yes. just admire his courage and his leap of faith. And yes. he's already a legend in the making already, but mm -hmm. knowing the sacrifice that he's getting ready to make 
as a Christian man, but just going straight into a not for profit that he created and knowing that he's just walking away from the table. He's walking yeah. away from money and he's walking into what God has called him to do. And I, I, I just admire him for it. I'm just like, yeah. Lord, give me the strength. You know, I've got a family yeah. to take care of. I got a family right. to feed. And I need to just start saying, Lord, you got a family to take care of and right. you got a family to feed. Right make it happen. So th thank you for sharing that's, that. An, that's another reason for honoring these people because of the sacrifices they've made, not just for their families, but for their churches and for their community. Um, and God gives us ways to give back. You know, we all want to give back in big ways. You yes. know, so our name is up in, in lights, but there are so many ways to give back. There's so many things you can do that may be small. They may seem like they run under the radar, but the lives they touch mean the world. So uh, I applaud him as well and you, because I think even this platform is giving back, is bringing an awareness to what is going on in the yes. community. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. All right, let's get into something that the Ezra Project is heavily into. Um, you've been doing a lot of work on the human trafficking and the sex trafficking side. So mm -hmm. I should have done more homework to pull up statistics that I used to have with me but it's a very, very huge industry. Yeah, it's huge. It's, I think, second only to uh, guns. Um, it, there, there's lots going on in trafficking. There's human trafficking for labor and there's child trafficking where kids are even kidnapped in some countries to go to war. But then the sex trafficking, we don't, I think the church doesn't pay attention. If you look around and when you travel, you know, it always amazes me to go into airport and see a sign in the women's restroom that says, call this number, you know, because things are going on. Wow. Um, the church thinks they are immune. And so often we accuse the bad girls in particular of, of, but that's not what's going on. The world has changed. The face of the pimp has changed. It's not a guy anymore. It may be a woman. It yes. may be a young person. It's not, um, there are kids who go to school and their parents think they're in school. They're not in school. You know, they walk in one door, walk out the other door. Some kids have been known to leave in the middle of the night. Parents don't even know they're gone. Yeah. Um, they get hung up in things and it's not all internet problems or whatever. As I've traveled, we've gone to Alaska, um, to Juneau, Alaska, in Atlanta, um, in, in, in several places. I'm always taken aback by talking about this in churches because inevitably, somebody comes up to me and says, let me tell you what happened in my family. Let mm. me tell you what happened in my church. Uh, I was with one pastor. He said, I want you to go in my office and talk to a mother whose daughter had been, tra had been trafficked. She got the daughter back when the daughter was still young, a teen. Mm -hmm. um, oh. oh, I think uh, Dr. Sales just lost power, folks. And so I'm going to take over. Man, that story was just getting good when it comes to human trafficking. So um, I actually spoke at a seminar um, uh, for Dr. Sales uh, during the human trafficking event. I crafted a spoken word piece that was designed specifically to deal with uh, sex trafficking. I think it's interesting, uh, not going to say any names because I don't have a network of lawyers and I don't want to be sued. Um, but it's interesting to know that, you know, um, allegedly a owner of a football team uh, got caught up in some things uh, once before when it came to sex trafficking. And all of a sudden those charges were dropped after a year and a half investigation. Don't know the reasons, but we already know that when it came time for some of these major football events, the all star game um, is one of them um, that when it came to some of these events, when it came to sex trafficking, you know, it was heavily known that prostitution would be around the Super Bowl or that prostitution would be around these other major events. And so, again, I'm not going to say a name of any particular owners of the NFL team who were allegedly cleared of any wrongdoing when it came to these prostitution rings. But I find it super interesting that, you know, during these Super Bowl events, that there are people who are bringing in girls young ladies to meet with some of these high profile people to actually engage in sexual activity. So I wanted to mention that and I'll bring Dr. Sales right back in. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's that's very important. Uh, there are certain months, certain events that we know are, are huge in trafficking, but it's constant. It's not just girls, it's also boys, mm. sometimes as young as eight, nine years old. So it's not just the teenagers. Um, if a young person is trafficked, someone under 18, it is automatically trafficking. There is no consent to be given. There is, you know, nothing else that 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 uh, says this is okay. And so, to be able to help churches to understand that um, this is a problem, and it's in our community, it's in our churches. There are houses. Um, we were in Atlanta with a group of people who were from, it was a conference, they were from all over the country. And I was shocked within a week after coming home, one man called me, his daughter um, had to, they lived in Connecticut and she was going to school in New York and she had to take a train. Her daughter was, his daughter was propositioned on the train, on the, on the train. And he was like, I never would have known to, to be careful or to, to know what was going on otherwise. Um, people have called me and said, you know, they just raided the house down the street. I knew there was a lot going on. I knew there were a lot of people there, but yes. I didn't know what was going on. Yes. So it's, it's very real. Um, there are signs, there are some organizations. Uh, Salvation Army uh, is one that I look to um, because they do a lot with, not only with rescue and with housing uh, for young people who are transitioning and, and, and getting away, from trafficking, trafficking and able now to, to begin to function as survivors. But they also give some advice to churches. You know, as churches, we wanna say, uh, oh my goodness, let me just stand on the corner and pray for everybody. And it's gonna be all right. Well, it's not gonna be all right. right. Um, you shouldn't go up and approach people. Um, you have to be trained to do that kind of work. So the work I do is not that. <laughs> the work I do is in the area of education. Yes. And there are lots of groups that do education. But I, my thing, the Ezra thing, is that the Black community, the churches in the Black community are not educated about these things. They don't talk about them. The Some of the mainline churches, there's a, a, a document that Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopalian, other church faith groups have put together for several years about things churches can do uh, from having uh, prayer sessions to, you know, uh, all kinds of things. But the, in the black community is nothing. The Salvation Army comes closest, I think, to helping us understand mm -hmm. that um, we need to be able to look and see what's going on around us and we need to know what our restrictions are on what we can do. Mm -hmm. So what I'm working on, I work with uh, uh, Renee, um, okay, now I'm not gonna remember her name. I'm sorry, <laughs> the organization, the organization is, um, uh, okay, I'm gonna just go blank all together. Compassion, Mercy and Justice. Uh, and it's a shame I can't remember Renee's name because I taught her in school for real. Mm -hmm. um, but Renee's been doing a lot of work and she's going to be uh, part of who we're interviewing uh, on next Thursday night and a survivor who will also be with us um, uh, to talk about this issue and what they've been through. And when you hear the stories, you understand just how close to home it comes. Sometimes people are trafficked by people in their families. You know, it's not always the stranger and uh, people just get in situations and the, but the church cannot turn a blind eye. Yeah, I, I don't want to mention a certain R&B singer who's incarcerated night right now, but allegedly yes. one of the girls said, my parents pushed me into this dude. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. you know, my parents pushed me into this guy's yes. arm. So I think that's interesting right. you say that. Please tell the people about the event because you have a big event coming up um, yeah. next week. Uh, what we started doing uh, was um, I wanted to, as we, we haven't done as much with trafficking this year as we had year before COVID hit. And uh, we were doing a lot more with churches and whatnot. So we were trying to find some ways to do it. So I created this thing called SHIFT. And SHIFT means uh, it's a time, it's a monthly program where every time we look at a different issue and kind of shift our attention to that and see mm -hmm. what's going on, where this church fit, how is it impacting our lives? Wow. And so this coming Thursday, next Thursday, the 17th at seven o'clock uh, on Facebook Live, 
um, will be having will have an interview about human trafficking and get a chance to hear someone's story, get a chance to find out um, just what people are, uh, what we, people can do, what churches can do, and others can do to kind of pay attention, uh, but also to um, go beyond just praying but actually helping their families and helping other people and, and um, you know, just realizing that this is real, shift your attention to realize it's real. Yeah. So we've done several things with shift. The first one uh, was on um, uh, fertility, which is a huge issue in the black community. Nobody realizes that, but infertility is a big issue. Uh, so every month we do something different, but coming up, Renee Shepard Owens, thank you, Lord. Renee Shepard Owens uh, will be with me in that interview and um, we'll be talking about what uh, what can be done. And she'll be telling her story also about how she got involved in both in rescue and in education and how she happened to form her ministry as well. Yeah, she's a powerful speaker. I would love to have her on. So please, please yeah. make the connection for me. Well, I definitely, yeah, definitely have the flyer and I'll be sharing that on the Be In The Mix um, uh, social media page. I, I host this show through Be In The Mix on Facebook, so I'll be sure um, to share this with them, to, with the community, because I think it's something Great. that we all need to be aware of. Uh, my, my my daughter will be turning eight, 16 very soon, and I let her know that you know we're going into a phase of different conversations, right. and I'm going to make you uncomfortable, yeah. but I need you to hear me. We, 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 we talk about the movie Taken all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not mm -hmm. the reality of what gets to happen yeah. when a child is snatched or when a student right. is snatched in right. international waters. I just I want her to be real aware of the dangers that are out there and that exist. Um, exactly. You know, young people tend to think that it's about us not trusting them, and it's not at all. It's it's being aware of this world and what can happen. I have very vivid memories of some place that a loved one used to take me and drop mm -hmm. me off at. Those memories have surfaced within the last year. Um, I have not shared them yet with anyone because mm -hmm. I have to reconcile how to deal with them and how to handle this recall. Yes. But I know that every time the Lord reveals a childhood memory or trauma that it's for me to write about, mm -hmm. because at the time he gives me something to write, I'll be able to share that with someone else Right. and lift them up um, and pull them out of where they are. Um, mm -hmm. Lovely lyricist, he said, the black community has so much on its plate that sadly trafficking isn't high on the list. We are constantly fighting what is supposed to be given as a human being. Yes. Wow. She's right. We really do. And I'm glad that you mentioned your daughter. And I hope that people will tune in, not just for themselves, but for young people as well. Uh, my niece, when she was about 14, she helped with the logistics of, of a thing we were doing. And she said, Auntie, I never knew, you know, that that uh, very often it's it's one kid who lets somebody know that their friend is getting inappropriate emails. Um, the police department um, I've been in some trainings with them and, and so forth. Um, people who lure kids away. Once some man came to a city and um, somebody told it and the police were able to intercept. All he had with him was a great big, great, big empty suitcase. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So there are so many things and young people need to know. We shelter our kids so much, which is hilarious because they know more than we do. They know more than we did at their ages and they know more than we do now. And it's and we have to be honest and not hide behind, not act like things aren't real, um, not act like they don't have problems because they do. But we must address them and give them safe, safe space to talk, to share, to understand and to process those feelings and those ideas. Because just as things are coming back to you, things are happening to them that they don't understand all the time. And so, yes. you know, it's important that young people be involved in the conversation, particularly on sex trafficking, but on so much of what's going on on mental health and on so much of what's going on in our community and that we give them the values to be able to say to make choices. Yeah. You know, we no, you don't have to do that because all your friends did. You yes. Know, we know our parents said that, too, but it's more dangerous now than it's ever been before. So yeah, keep young people in the loop, in the mix for definitely. Yeah, I, th I think it's really interesting. I remember being on a panel um, where we had a um, we had um, a young ladies mentoring program uh, and you know, it had all boys on the panel, a couple of men in there as well. And one of the young ladies just shared how um, 
beautiful young lady, um, heavy set, and mm-hmm. she shared about how um, she was almost her, her boyfriend tried to rape her, mm. and she never told anyone. Yeah, the first time she told someone was when she told us on this panel. Yeah. And, you know, she was very open and candid about it. And she said, so she stopped, she started eating so she wouldn't feel attractive because she felt if she wasn't attractive, that no man would try to rape her again. Right. And I asked her, well, why didn't you even feel safe to tell your dad? And she said, you have to understand my culture, Mr. Briscoe. Mm -hmm. If something like this happens in my culture, it's your fault. We're Latinos. She said, it's my fault. It means I put myself in a position and that whatever happens, I deserve. So I didn't want to deal with the emotional weight of that. I just decided to eat it away. And I was just like, wow, the amount of pressure on our young people, people culturally, when something like this happens, that it's automatically demonizing them instead of the actual perpetrator in these instances. I'll tell you something else that people do Uh, in the school system some years ago. Uh, and this was before I knew I was a mandated reporter. People don't tell people that they're mandated reporters. You have to tell it. You cannot keep it to yourself. And I went to my principal about someone in our school who I thought had been inappropriate. And the principal was like, well, yeah, I'm going to talk to the young man. And And I'm like, no. Uh, I used to, on a national level, talk about abuse. And you would be shocked by the number of pastors who'd say, well, uh, we're going to pray for that brother. We're going to bring him to the brotherhood and we go to. No, that's not what you do. Churches are supposed to report these things and, and whether it's abuse or trafficking, they churches need to be aware and they need to act on it and yes. don't keep it back from the police and back from the authorities uh, because you end up with people like that young lady who ate herself you know, into a state that was not good simply yeah. so that no one would bother her. Absolutely. Uh, and young people repress, as we all do. You repress those thoughts. So by all means, the church needs to, to step up. Um, we need to know. I'm always taken aback by the mothers who ignore what's happening to their daughters and blame their daughters. You know, it's, it's like I said before, it's systemic. It's not just one thing. It's never just one thing. There's a plethora of what's going on. And so we have to involve our young people in the conversations. We have to involve the church. We have to get let people know that there are spaces, safe places to talk and do what we can to support those people who are doing other things. Yes. I mentioned earlier the Salvation Army. Those places that have um, homes for people to go to so that they can be safe, sometimes they just need donations. You may never know where the home is, but contact the organization and help uh, in any way you can to make it better. You yes, know? yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. So you said you have two, two scholarships or award opportunities. I'd like you to share yes. how those young people who are involved in the church and the community, where do they go um, to apply? And the same piece for the award scholarship for those who are, and again, she said the scholarship, you don't have to be going to a college Uh, but you can be going to a trade school as well for the scholarship opportunity. And for those who are pursuing seminary degrees of some level, there's also opportunities for them. So how can they find and apply for these opportunities? Okay. They should go to the Ezra project, www.theezraproject.com. And on our website, you'll see um, the uh, scholarship applications. Uh, There's still time. I think it's the end of the month. Uh, our scholar chair was really nice. So she pushed it to the end of the month uh, for our high school students to uh, be able to apply. Um, the We will also take seminary students who are really are applying now. Then there's a committee that goes through and they use a rubric to determine um, the level of involvement. The main thing is involvement in the church because very often, uh, you know, I, I, it bothers me to hear people say that young people are not involved in the church, but they are. And so we need to recognize that they're giving back to the faith community. And a lot of our young people are giving back to the community, whether they're marching with Black Lives Matters or they're out helping to feed homeless people or they're doing whatever. Their work is as important yes. as that senior work that we're honoring as well. So we're looking at, are you giving back to the community and are you working within your church, your faith tradition? And it can be uh, any Christian faith tradition. 
So they could be Baptist, they could be Methodist, they could be Catholic, you know, but they need to be, uh, those two things are the most important. Now, obviously, you know, you got to have some grades to be able to get in and, <laughs> and just proof that you, that you right. actually are going to the school, but it's a $1,000 award. Uh, it's a one-time $1,000 award, and it is for that young person to do what they want. That's why it's not a scholarship. It's not applied to your tuition or anything like that. Sometimes we have young people, they just need to buy some clothes to go to school, or yes. they just need to be able to get car fare or to buy books or to do whatever it is that they need to do. But we want to say thank you. Last year, we gave eight awards for the um, uh uh, Michael Sales Legacy, which is the high school graduates. And the Rosa Sales Legacy is for those adults who are in seminary or Bible college. Now, it has to be an accredited seminary or Bible college. Uh, you can find out by checking out uh, the accreditation status with the U.S. government. Uh, there are lots of schools and people who jump up and say, well, I'm a minister. I'm going to mentor ministers. So you just come and go to my school and I'm going to give you a diploma. Well, right. Yeah, that came out of your backyard and bless your yeah, heart. Yeah, we're not but talking we, about Bedside Baptist University. No, no <laughs> we, we, you, you know, that's not where we are. We want to get minds and be, and one reason for it is as we learn, we change how we view things. We 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 see the world differently and we see our faith differently and we see God working in us differently. So we really want uh, young people in accredited schools and accredited programs, whether vocational or high school, and we want uh, seminarians, and they can be at any level in seminary. They For high school, they have to be entering high school this fall, entering college this fall, and just graduated. But for seminary, they could be any level. Please apply. And you, you know, you'd be surprised uh, um, at the young people who don't look for money and don't apply for money. You know, I have a person who's gave money this year for books. You know, uh, there are lots of scholarship opportunities out there, lots of money out there, but we drag our feet. Sometimes we just don't know. And I'm always amazed at how many of our young people are the first in their families to go to college. You know, I thought I was the first in my family. I thought that was over, but it's not. It's still going on. So there's a lot of work to be done and we want to help people do it. Yeah, I, I have a goal to encourage young people. I don't believe that college is for everyone. No. But since I started, I said everyone needs to go and you make the decision for yourself mm -hmm. if college is for you or not. But you got to mm -hmm. get into a trade. Before I let you go, I do want to share this last comment. Uh, this is from Lovely Lyricist. She says, I can't equate. I remember being about 10 years old and old men catcalling about my legs. Mm -hmm. I found myself covering up and wearing pants, jogging suits to not show them looking, uh, show, looking like a, she was, she ended up looking like a tomboy. Exactly. Uh, it's, and it's, it's what we do. You know, it's interesting that we talk about body shaming now and everybody's, you know, don't body shame, you know, that, but we do it to our young people all the time, just like when older men are yelling at this young girl. And so what she in effect is body shamed to think she's not beautiful, to think she doesn't have a right to be beautiful. You know, uh, you know, her legs are God given, you know, they're your legs. You know, you walk on them. You, it's OK. Yeah. But when we do those things, it really hurts and it leaves a scar. Lyricist is no longer 10 years old, but she remembers, yes. you know, yes. and it hurts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Dr. Sales, thank you for your impact in the community in my life, I, I'll never forget that first session of Chicago State. You know, my I told my daughter like, "Oh, you're going, like you're going," and I don't know if that was what kind of planted a seed in her. She's really into criminal investigations, sure. uh, not the TV show. She like watches the right. documentaries, like right. she's really into that. But I took her there, and there was really raw language and conversation there. And mm -hmm. I just said, "Hey, you're probably going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but..." You need to be uncomfortable because there are things that I could say to you that you'd be like, oh, that's just dad talking. No, you need to hear from women who right. work this, who've been experienced to this. I remember the testimony. I think it was of a suburban alderman whose mm -hmm. daughter was all on the news or, or, mm -hmm. or niece was all on the news when yes. she got killed. She was only yes. 15 years old. Yes. Right. So I was glad she was there to see that. And I'm looking forward to sharing the information for next week. 
Thank you, Dr. Thank Sales, you. for coming on to Tony Briscoe Live. I appreciate you coming through for me. Uh, well, thank Always. you for inviting me. And I hope that I've shared something today that helps someone. And thank you for highlighting the work that we're doing in the Ezra Project. I appreciate a it. Absolutely. Thank you. Talk thank to you, you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to Tony Briscoe Live. That is the wonderful Dr. Rosa Sales of the Ezra project. Please look into the scholarship opportunities that they have available. I did put those in the comments on my personal Facebook page, on uh, my, my YouTube channel, as well as the Be In The Mix uh, Facebook page as well. I'll close out with this. There's only one reason I can think of where our politicians, specifically the GOP, do not want a commission on January 6, 2021. Now, this is my conspiracy theory. But would a commission actually unravel some of those same politicians who are sitting in their seats who were complicit in the January 6th insurrection? By the way, Blue Lives Matter. But I didn't see anybody marching Blue Lives Matter when that pol Capitol Police officer was killed. I didn't see anybody standing up marching for him or anything. Now, supposedly a couple of them committed suicide as well. And that's always tragic, right? But where are those who are so pro-police now? Haven't seen them. Haven't heard from the NRA as usual. There's a reason they don't want to commission people. It's because they don't want the truth to come out. They don't want to show where they were complicit. And they don't want to be tried with treason. But we all know who called for the insurrection on January 6th. We all watched the same press conference. We all saw him there cheering on with his people as they watched down the street in safety while our nation's capital was attacked. This is the America that we live in. This is the problem with having politicians in place who've been there for 40, 50 years. There needs to be change. So for those who think your vote doesn't matter, you better wake up. They don't make restrictive voting laws. <laughs> if your vote didn't matter, your vote matters. Don't just talk about it. Go be about it. This is Tony Briscoe. Thank you for tuning in to Tony Briscoe Live. I'll catch you all next week. I'm out of here.